This is the full spectrum laser cutter and engraver. We've nicknamed this one the salamander based on the myth that these lizards are born in fire. That's because the laser basically burns things, although it does so in a very controlled and precise way. So any organic material that burns can be used in the salamander. Cardstock paper, felt, cardboard, masonite, plywood, acrylic sheet. These are just some of the materials you can bring to the cutter. Because it's basically <laughs> a radioactive lizard that breathes fire, this is the most dangerous machine in the shop if you don't keep it tamed. We don't like to play the bad cop, but we have to follow a one strike and you're out policy for following the safety protocols. If you remember nothing else, remember this. Never leave the machine unattended when it's actively cutting material, or you might have this on your hands. This training covers the basics. Enhanced guides can be found in the red binder at the Makerspace. Here, you can find the SOP, the Quick Start Guide, and the User Manual PDFs. The time this machine takes really depends on the complexity of the job. A small job like our demo file, cut in a thin material like corrugated cardboard, can take just minutes. A complex multi-object cut in quarter-inch thick acrylic can take a couple of hours. Most first-time jobs involve cutting a full sheet of corrugated cardboard with a dozen or so cuts, and this averages about 15 to 20 minutes per sheet. If the job is sufficiently complex, spend a half hour in the laser driver software to acquire a time estimate, then double that to calculate a reservation time. This allows a redo if your material fails. Post-processing is also highly variable, depending on complexity. A simple engraving requires simple cleanup of a half an hour or less. A complex acrylic plastic job with removal of backing paper may take hours to clean. Consult with staff for advice and sign up for a workshop space accordingly. Here's where to use the reservation sign-up form at the Makerspace website. Just open the form and follow the on-screen prompts to fill in your info for the laser cutter for processing or for a workshop space for post-processing. You can sign up for both back-to-back -back or spread the job out. In this demo, we'll do a simple corrugated cardboard job for a cut and an engraving, but there are many choices for material to work with. Many materials we've tested are on display in the shop with settings data to help you set up your job. We also have a table on the Makerspace website with this data. Use these settings as the basis for a test cut, adjusting to your specific material if needed. We carry complementary corrugated cardboard for you to cut a first project. You may use two of the new 12 by 20 sheets to cut a project or you can use as much of the recycled cardboard as you wish. We also carry small complementary samples of material on display for you to test before you purchase any material to bring in. Consult with staff if you're unsure about what kind of material to use on a project or where to purchase it. We'll help with both. Some materials are not permitted on the tool. Urethanes, vinyls, and especially PVCs are never permitted as they create toxic fumes that can corrode the machine and your lungs. Certain plastics or composite materials, like foam core, are permitted only by special arrangement. Styrene and polypropylene are conditionally permitted since certain thicknesses can create terrible gooey melty messes. Consult with staff before you work with any uncertain material. Our maximum cutting area is nominally 12 inches by 20 inches, but practically you want to limit the cutting area to 11 by 19 to allow a half inch margin. The machine will often return a fail if you push it too far to the edge. The lens on the optic head focuses the laser into a powerfully super hot focal height 
of one quarter inch. So that's the allowable maximum thickness of material. Material can be as thin as you need, but be aware that some materials, such as thin paper, will curl when cut, and this curl will often interrupt the laser path and ruin your material. Consult with staff and do a test cut if in doubt. The Laser Cutter Workstation contains vector and raster graphic software, along with a driver for the laser cutter itself. Load your file onto the drive. Don't process a project directly from a flash drive. Vector graphics can be used for cutting and engraving. Raster, also known as bitmap or pixel-based graphics, can be used for engraving only. However, it is possible to use an auto-tracing feature to generate a vector from a high-resolution raster object. Here, we're going to work with Inkscape, the open source vector art program, but this operation can be similar in apps such as Adobe Illustrator. Before you start any cutting, inspect your vector art to make sure it's ready. You want to avoid duplicate vectors and these can sometimes be hard to spot. An easy way to do this is to select the vector object by clicking on it with the selection tool and move it. If there's an exact duplicate underneath, you can delete the one you just moved. Do this as many times as there are duplicates. If a move reveals no hidden duplicates, you can undo to return the vector object to its original position. You want to avoid detail that the laser will ruin. Thin or tiny detail cuts can often curl up and burn, ruining a sheet of material and possibly much worse. Rule of thumb, avoid detail that is thinner than the thickness of your material. If you're working with an eighth inch thick cardboard, don't cut a 1 16th inch wide strip of material. Remember, detail that might work at a big scale might turn into an uncuttable detail if you scale it down. If in doubt, ask the staff. One other condition to avoid is an open path. Inspect your paths to make sure that they are closed so shapes can be properly separated from the stock. Here in Inkscape, we are opening an SVG file, which is a generic scalable vector graphics extension. It's possible to use a PDF or an AI file in other software. For orientation purposes, it's helpful to set the document size to be the same as your cutting area, but the laser driver will only recognize the vector art so this is optional. If you're doing an engraving instead of a cut, the file can be an SVG or it can be a raster file like JPEG or PNG, which will open in a program like Photoshop or GIMP. If engraving from vector, make sure all vector shapes are filled with black. If using raster, make sure the graphic is 300 pixels per inch or higher and it should be a high contrast black and white image only. Whether engraving or cutting, you will need to open Retina Engrave, the laser driver software, before you send a job to it. It won't automatically kick on like an ordinary printer driver. Organize your desktop so that you can see both the design software and the laser driver window. This gets confusing in a full screen mode. Back in the design software, find File and Print, and in the dialog box, select the full spectrum engineering driver, then select Print. You'll see an intermediate transfer dialog box pop up. This dialog will sometimes prompt you to select vector or raster information only, depending on file size. If you see the visual data expressed in the driver viewport, you may close this dialog. Depending on the job, you'll see a vector tab for cutting and a raster tab for engraving, alongside a design tab that we rarely use. The job is ready to cut, but we'll review safety procedures and basic setup before we turn on the machine. The laser is safe if you make it safe, but you must be aware of what that means. 
Before you operate the machine, you must perform laser safety training and pass a quiz for certification at the PSU Environmental Health and Safety website. This website can be confusing, so we have instructions on the training page under safety at the Makerspace website to do this work. And you can also consult with staff to help you get it done. Once certified with EHS and finished with this tool-specific training, you are cleared to use the machine. The most obvious danger is fire. You'll see we have a multi-tiered safety protocol for this, and you become the first line of defense. When the laser is firing, you must never leave it alone. Doing so will get you banned from Makerspace forever. If a fire should ignite, you become responsible for ensuring the safety of others. Here, we'll familiarize you with fire extinguishing tools and our emergency plan. As the machine runs, you are wearing tinted laser filter safety glasses at all times, so you can observe the cut. From your EHS training, you know that looking at a class 4 laser without these glasses can damage your eyes. As it runs, You'll see a lot of smoke and bright sparks or flash flames that don't persist. This is normal. What you are watching for will be glowing embers, that is, material that is smoldering without flames or for persistent flames that don't go out. If you see embers that persist, the material is about to ignite. Hit the big red stop button, open the lid, and grab the small water spray bottle Aim the water spray under the red optics head directly at the embers or the base of the flame. If the fire doesn't respond to that, grab the special fire extinguisher located under the counter to the left of the workstation, pull the pin, lift the extinguisher, aim the nozzle at the base of the flame and squeeze the trigger. If that doesn't work, it's time to warn others and evacuate. Announce loudly to everyone that all must exit. As you exit, find one of the fire alarms located along the egress path and pull it. Then get out of the building. Our rally point is the parking lot to the south of Rydal. Make sure everyone who was with you in the space shows up to that rally point. If you see someone missing, notify a first responder that someone is not accounted for. There's another layer of protection. It's the red fireball located above the machine. This is a fusible fire suppressant device that will rapidly deploy when touched by flame and save other equipment in the room. It won't harm you if it activates, but you want to be long gone before this baby has a chance to do its thing. Other hazards include smoke and dust inhalation, burning hazards, and machine overheating. We'll introduce you to the remediation and elimination of these dangers as we set up for the job. Before turning on the system, do a complete visual inspection. Make sure the laser cutter is stable on the countertop and that all fire suppression materials, water bottle, fire extinguisher, and fireball are present and easily accessible. Notice the HEPA filter system under the counter. This eliminates dangerous dust and fumes. Next to it, notice the water bucket for the cooling system. If the machine refuses to run, it could mean there's a water flow blockage or the water needs to be replaced. Behind the filter is an air compressor. This keeps the optics clean and the laser beam sharp by blowing a steady stream of air. As you open the laser cutter to inspect inside, notice a small magnetic latch at lower right. This is a fusible latch that will turn the laser feed off if opened. Make sure this latch makes contact. Inside the machine, notice the honeycomb cutting grill. If there is any debris in or adjacent to the grill, clean it. Debris can be a fire hazard. Finally, Notice a cylindrical aluminum billet resting behind the control area at the front right side of the machine. 
This is used to focus the laser and should always be returned to this spot. If any element of this system appears missing or potentially inoperable, like for example if a hose or wiring looks disconnected, notify the staff before proceeding. Next, load in your material. You can remove the cutting grill to do so, then reinsert it. This allows you to tape your material down if this helps eliminate warping. Return the grill, setting it inside the shims for stability. Consult the material settings database at the website or on the display above the machine to help you select settings. We're finally ready to rev it up. Turn on the entire equipment system by activating the power strip adjacent to the laser cutter. Be aware this turns on all the machinery, but it does not actually activate the laser or the HEPA filter. Press the red button on the HEPA filter before activating the laser. The laser will activate via the laser driver software. So, return to Retina Engrave. Let's take a moment to understand this interface a bit more. To engage the software with the laser, we first need to establish a network connection. Check the control display at the right side of the laser, and you should see a numerical network address displayed. If not, restart the laser cutter. Then, at the lower left of the Retina Engrave window, notice the connection status. If you don't see the numerical address from the cutter, select the arrow icon and establish the connection. Next, find and select the home icon in the upper toolbar. This will essentially allow the machine to understand where it is in coordinate space. Use the jog arrows at the right side to position the optics head near the upper left hand corner of the stock. This is a good time to focus the optic head. Find the aluminum billet at its home behind the controls. Use the thumb screw at the front of the red chassis to loosen, then carefully lift it, and place the billet under the lens. Lower the chassis carefully until it rests on the billet, then tighten the thumb screw and return the billet to its home. Use the square four arrow icon to test the perimeter of your vector work to ensure the laser will not overstep your stock. You will sometimes get a failure notice that the size of the job exceeds the margins of the cut area. Jogging to the left or right slightly will sometimes clear this. Once the perimeter is checked, set the speed, power, and number of passes according to the initial setup in the material settings database. In corrugated cardboard, we set 100 for speed, 40 for power, and 3 for passes. If we have layers in our file, we can turn off a layer by setting its passes to 0. We'll run this job by selecting the green button in the Retina Engrave toolbar and run a test. Repeat to refine your settings if necessary. We watch this job run like a hawk with our laser filter safety glasses on. After a successful test, run your actual design file, repeating the homing, jogging, and perimeter. If we need to leave a job to take a break, we hit pause, the yellow button, then we hit green to resume again. Using the red button is fatal to the job, so use it only if you intend to abort entirely. Remove the job from the cutter after it stops and inspect your work.
This one came out quite clean with no burns and no incomplete cuts. It's a similar process for engraving, except we use the raster tab and raster data boxes. While here, notice the icons that allow you to reverse shape and negative space, rotate the work, or mirror flip it. These are handy if you are working on jobs like rubber stamps or linoleum block printing plates and didn't pre-process your work as such. Returning to the controls, we repeat the jog, home, and perimeter steps, and we again observe our material settings database, this time for engraving data. The user interface can be confusing here. For raster jobs, power and speed are set here, but the number of passes is still set down there. Deep engravings, such as for rubber stamps, can often use 10 or more passes. For this demo, we'll just do one, and we're setting the speed for 100 and the power for 10. Notice how the engraving acts like scan lines on a printer. You can see that engraving jobs are more time consuming as a rule than vector cut jobs. For some materials, it's advisable to use transfer tape, which we store with the vinyl cutting supplies. Damp transfer tape on plywood helps to mitigate smudging and overburning, for example. Dry transfer tape on acrylic keeps the top of the cut sharp. Notes about the use of transfer tape can be found at the Material Settings database. Consult with staff if you're unsure about its use. Post-processing is quite material dependent, but some general guidelines include the following. When the job is complete, turn off the system from the power strip. Remove the cutting grill and clean any debris on the floor of the cutter. At a workstation, remove any tape that's holding the stock down Then with a large piece of cardboard on top, flip the stock and grill over together so the grill is now on top. Keep pressure on this assembly so small parts don't fly away. Remove the grill and you'll see the cut parts arrayed in the stock. The unused portion of the stock is known as a blank. And this is not trash yet, especially if your job has lots of complex parts. Keep the parts inside the blank with tape or sheets of cardboard until you are ready to assemble your work. Use your original design file to keep track of the parts, labeling in pencil or with tape if needed. After you've processed your parts, you can discard the blank, though sometimes they are quite cool patterns. With cardboards, textiles like felt, and wood products, you can glue objects together with a common casein glue like Elmer's. A little goes a long way. With acrylics and other plastics, rely on mechanical fasteners such as nuts and machine screws, or use chemical welding solvents like Weldon. We rarely recommend hot glues or other thick dimensional adhesives. If you're unsure about assembling laser cut parts, staff will be happy to make suggestions. We've only really scratched the surface of what's possible in this demo. We hope you're inspired to push the boundaries with safety in mind, of course. When finished, dispose of leftover material, backing paper, and transfer tape in a regular waste container. For monitors only, water from the cooling system and HEPA filters 
can be safely disposed of in a conventional manner. But a spent laser tube must be disposed of through EHS. And please remember to clean your workstation and return all tools to the proper place for your colleagues.